We have a terrific event for you this evening featuring Taffy uh, brodesser Ackner um, in conversation with uh, Jake Tapper. Uh, Taffy's new book, Fleischman is in Trouble, is, is a delight to read and to promote. Uh, it's one of the hot books of the summer uh, and one of the best debut novels to appear this year. Ron Charles, in his own rave review in the Washington Post yesterday, began with the words, Believe the hype. <laughs> Fleischman is in trouble is even better than we were promised. The book opens with uh, Dr. Toby Fleischman, a 41-year-old doctor, reveling in uh, his post-divorce life. After uh, more than 14 years of marriage, he's free of his ambitious wife, is beginning to feel optimistic about life again, and thanks to dating apps, he's surrounded by love interests. Then, one day, his ex-wife, Rachel, a successful talent agent, drops off the kids and disappears, throwing Toby's life into chaos. As he struggles to figure out what happened, he has to revise his ideas about himself, his family, and his marriage. The book is a fun, smart, disturbing, and insightful portrait of modern marriage. It has humor and heart, and it's hard to put down once you've, once you've uh, gotten started. Although this is Taffy's first book, many of you, especially if you're readers of the New York Times, are probably already familiar with her writing. She's an accomplished feature writer on the staff of the Times Magazine and is known particularly for her entertaining and incisive profiles of celebrities, among them Bradley Cooper, Andy Cohen, Tonya Harding, Ethan Hawke, Tom Hiddleston, Don Lemon, Nicki Minaj, and Gwyneth Paltrow, just to name a few. Now, Taffy grew up in Brooklyn and for college attended NYU studying screenwriting. She landed a job at Media Bistro, a website that offers resources to aspiring journalists. There, she hired a guy named Claude, who was then a reporter for Variety in Los Angeles. Uh, she hired him to run a, a workshop. In time, they fell in love and got married, and she moved across the country to be with him working out of Media Bistro's L.A. office. When the company sold, Taffy, by then pregnant with their first son, saved what she'd earned and used the money to launch a freelance career. Later, the family moved back east, and Taffy kept writing, contributing pieces to GQ magazine and The Times before joining uh, The Times full-time uh, two years ago. If you're looking for parallels between Taffy's life and the characters of her book, a couple uh, surface ones aren't, aren't uh, difficult to find. The book's narrator, for instance, is a former, former men's magazine writer, as Taffy is, and Taffy's own parents were divorced when she was six. Although she and Claude, who've now been married 13 years, are, according to recent media profiles of her, showing no signs of splitting. Now, Taffy will be joined here, as I mentioned, with Jake Tapper, whom Taffy profiled in GQ two years ago under the headline, The Realist Man in Fake News. Her article recounted how Jake, in his leading roles on two CNN news programs, has become a media star with his savvy, tough, quick-witted questioning of Trump administration officials. Let me read just a few sentences from that profile. While so many anchors feel obliged to maintain their Ron Burgundy anchoriness, Tapper allows an incredulousness and maybe even a smidge of disgust, disgust to sneak on through. In those moments when he augments the standard newsman persona to include his own uh, come-off-it realness, he has a way of embodying all of us. This may be his biggest public service. In addition to Jake's success as a, as a TV journalist, he also has authored three nonfiction books, The Outpost about one of the deadliest battles of the war in Afghanistan, Down and Dirty about the Florida recount that ended the 2000 presidential race, and Body Slam about Jesse Ventura's transformation from pro wrestler to Minnesota governor. And last year, he branched into fiction with the re release of a, a very well-received and engaging novel, The Hellfire Club, copies of which are also available at the front of the store. Uh, please join me in welcoming both Taffy and Jake. Thank you. I don't know if my parents have that many details about my life, so that's pretty good. It's pretty good. This is a good turnout. I come to this. Hi. This is our neighborhood bookstore, so I'm here all the time. I probably paid for half this place, and uh, and 
Uh, this is a really good turnout. Thank you. Yeah. All, a tip to authors, always have a handsome anchor man right. be asking questions. So let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Um, you, work prim you work primarily, almost entirely, except for this book, in nonfiction. Yes. So tell me about the challenge of writing fiction, because normally you are hewing to facts and here right. you're making them up. Yes. Yes. We're still hewing to facts. Um, um, in fiction, you know, the, the, the sentence that, that was read about your profile is a good example. Can you, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's fine, right? Yeah. Um, the sentence that was read about your profile is a good one, is that, I'm sorry. Okay. The, se <laughs> the sentence that was read about your profile is a good one, in that I'm, a, I'm good at observing, and to not have people I was observing was hard. Right. To not have to have to make people up and then picture what they look like and how they behave was a very hard thing for me to do. That said, it was really nice to write something and not be nervous about where my allegiances should be. And that's that's what happens. Like I spend time with someone and I like them and then I have to remember that I don't work for them. I work for the Times. I work for the reader. And that's the hardest part for me about journalism is that I do these, I have these like intense relationships with people and then I have to, I have to do what I have to do. Right. <laughs> so I, I read the book. I read an, an early ish copy of the book. Has anybody else here read uh, the book? I know it only came out Tuesday. It's really good, right? I mean, it's really a wonderful book. It's, des it's deserving of every letter of uh, every word of its praise that it's getting. Very it's nice. funny. It's interesting. It's smart. You talk about uh, your observational skills, which are obviously uh, impeccable. But beyond that, like you're you are observing the human condition and and taking things that you have seen in other people or right. maybe maybe actual people, or maybe just people on the street or whatever, and put it put them in um, in the novel. Tell me uh, how you got the idea for the book, the, the general story. So when I turned 40, people started, my friends started coming up to me and telling me that they were getting divorced, not coming up, asking, can I meet with you? I'm getting a divorce. And, and I would say, oh, that's terrible. Um, although, you know, I'd always think about, you know, I was at a lot of their weddings. It was kind of this moment of, of you know, at Jewish weddings, the rabbi always says something to the effect of, um, this, you know, this, this couple belongs to the community. The marriage is the responsibility of the community. And I'm like, well, I, I was asleep at the wheel for this. But by the time they were telling people, they were already fine with it. They had settled it. And now they were dating on these apps. <laughs> and these apps kind of lit me on fire. Like, I could not believe that whereas when I was dating in the 90s and you had to show up in your human form <laughs> somewhere and try not to look needy and try not to look like you needed too much love or that you wanted too much affection and try to look disdainful. Like, I couldn't pull it off. I could never pull that off. I was always like this. I was always like, hey, should we get married? Um, <laughs> I was always like that, so I wasn't a great dater, and I never, and I wasn't, um, and I wasn't really a digital dater. I had like a few months on on original J date under the handle of Matza Bride, <laughs> and and it, it wasn't going great. <laughs> and I saw these apps, and I saw how you're allowed. You could date now, you like. From bed, like you could, I, I'm, I'm a big multitasker and it really appealed to me that you could be in the bathroom, you could be watching television, you could be cooking dinner, you could be eating dinner, and you could be finding someone to date or something. How did it, for, how did you first get aware of the app? Like what is the moment where what, one of these divorced friends showed you what was on his I or her said, phone? I said, are you seeing anyone? And all of them were like, Am I seeing anyone? And they pulled out their phones. And I have to tell you, when you're a journalist, as you know, people tell you stories, right? That people are like, well, let me tell you the thing that just happened to me. Because it makes, it like, it gives them some sort of, I don't know what it does. It makes, maybe makes, uh, like legitimizes something if, if someone hears it or someone who knows how to listen to it hears it. 
And I could not get enough of it. It was, I mean, for the men, I couldn't get enough of it. The women were a whole other story. What's going on on the apps for women? I don't know if it's great. But for men... Well, tell, it, tell, tell me what you mean by that. Because I mean, what I mean, Okay, I'll tell you my favorite example is my friend who came over a few months ago to change her outfit at my house before she went on a date. And I was like, let me see your phone. Let me see his profile, right? He showed me his, like, marketing copy, right, of his... You know, what is it called? It's called a profile. Profile. It's called a profile, but it's marketing copy. Trust me. I write profiles. Those are not profiles. <laughs> and and he, this is what it said. It was, I'm so tired of manip manipulative women. If you're into mind games, need not apply or something stupid like that. But if you, like, but if you can be honest and a normal person let me know. And I was like, why are you going out with him? <laughs> like, what does this guy have for you? And she was like, this is the best of anybody in five miles. It's a radius. It's like, it's like, it's like seamless. It's like, what's the best Chinese in five miles? <laughs> this was the get, this was the best guy in five miles. And the, but the men are like women who are like, let me indulge your every fantasy. Let me let me tell you everything you ever wanted to hear about yourself. Let me send you the dirtiest pictures without any concern about what you might do with those pictures. Let me like, let's just have a good time either on this app tonight or a little bit later or tomorrow or tomorrow morning or in between dentist appointments or whatever it was and the men it was like amazing for the men and for the women it's a little less amazing but sometimes it's amazing for the women too I don't want to say I just want to say I'm rounding up and rounding down <laughs> so one of the reasons why it's fun to be a journalist is because you and I think you'll agree with this you get to meet people that you're interested in and ask them questions yes so as somebody who loved this book and has now read it twice let, let me, let me, I, this is fun for me because I get to ask you questions. So I don't want to spoil, I don't want to spoil the book, okay? I, but there is a moment where a, a, um, a teenage girl, a young teenage girl, a bat mitzvah age girl, yes. uh, uh, takes a picture of herself to, and sends it to a boy, uh, an inappropriate picture, and sends it to a boy. Mm -hmm. When did that, the, what, was that, as soon as you heard about the, the app, did that occur to you? The like, oh, and I'll show the other side of this, like what happens when this phenomenon reaches kids. I mean, how did that occur? It's not when it reaches kids. It's that the same woman who was changing her outfit at my house to go out with that very charming man. Um, also, a couple of months before, found fake, like found out that her daughter's Instagram posts are all fake. And there's a whole secret layer of Instagram posts that are real. And what I wanted to convey there is that like we're we're all playing with the same we're all playing the same strange game like from puberty on, it is like it's a mess. And now you're on these apps, and I'm not saying that their age ranges like the daughter was not on the app, but but this is the way this is the societal change in which we now convey desire. And so if I, I don't know if I were almost twelve and I were. And I were that, I don't know, it's really, it's worrisome. I don't mean it like that. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's fun, I promise. It's a good book. But <laughs> it's like, it, it, for him to see that the thing he's doing as an older person is also the thing that his children are expected to participate in, I thought would be a good jarring moment. And apparently it is. Yeah, and, and, also, um, and also the son... Yeah. Uh, has spends a lot of time looking at pornography. Again, this is not a spoiler. This doesn't spoil it the doesn't book at all. It. But it's the same. Everyone's it, son does. That. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, but that's the same. It's the same uh, phenomenon that you're talking about. Right. It's that. It's that. You know, like how did I learn about sex? Well, first it was a rumor that I was like that couldn't be, and then there were books, and then I read a Philip Roth book, and I was like, oh, this is what's going on, and now. If you, if you, instead of going to the dictionary, if you go to Google and you're like, what is sex? Do you, don't do that. <laughs> don't do it. So let me, uh, let me ask about some of the characters in the book. Okay. 
Rachel is the wife. Rachel is the wife from whom uh, Toby is divorcing. And, yes. and Rachel is the wife who is the talented talent agent yeah. uh, uh, who has, um, who just vanishes one day. Yes. Do you like Rachel? That's such a good question. I love all of them. I love and understand all of them. I feel like I am well acquainted with people who do terrible things and are still and are still not above the need or the or deserving of love. I love all of them. I think they all I think the thing that I wanted to do in this was the thing I do in a in a profile. You're a little bit different. Like when I profiled you, it was like you were like we we could have draped you in an American flag. Like Trump had just been elected, and you were like interviewing Kellyanne, like like with this face. Like remember? <laughs> um, and I mean, I'm not kidding. When I when I profiled Jake, there was a song on the internet that a woman sang called "Jake Tapper." I have a press crush on you. And I couldn't bring my child because he would have, he sings it a lot. Um, we but, the conversation okay, then go, back to then you. I'm going to go back to me. And I'm going to say, then, there, then take other people who are a little bit like, like Gwyneth Paltrow, who is, who is not a beloved American figure all the time. Um, I think all of those people are worthy. I think those are the most interesting profile subjects are the people who are, who you think you know and you're looking for this confirmation in them of why they're terrible people and you're forced to reckon with the fact that they have a point of view as well. Yeah. Everyone is, is, is they're very, they're actually very few people who do not deserve some kind of defense in this world. Right? Right? <laughs> there was a really, Somewhat. so a lot of the, review, Somewhat true. a lot of the reviewers have talked about um, what what your book says about marriage? I know. Um, can I ask you to I Can I ask you to read a passage? Oh, sure. Do you need glasses or anything? No. Okay. <laughs> I do. I know. But, but the, okay. So forty three. So, so this section. Okay. I'm kidding. Um, marriage is like the board in that old Othello game. He said as he ate a chicken breast baked dry, no added oil, please. The board is overwhelmingly full of white discs until someone places enough black discs in enough of the right places to flip all the discs to black. Marriage starts out full of white discs. Even when there are a few black ones on the board, it's still a white board. You get into a fight, ultimately fine and something to laugh at in the end, because the Othello board is still white. But when it finally happens and the black discs take over, the affair, the financial impropriety, the boredom, the midlife crisis, whatever it is that ends the marriage, the board becomes black. Now you look at the marriage, even the things that were formerly categorized as good memories, as tainted and rotted from the start. That adorable argument on the honeymoon was actually foreshadowing. The battle over what to name Hannah was my way of denying her the little family she had. Even the purely good memories are now haunted by a sense that I was a fool to allow myself to think that life was good and that a kingdom of happiness was mine. I told him I understood the metaphor, but also that's not how you play Othello. <laughs> And and one of the things that uh, that that passage reveals is that the narrator is Libby, uh, and Libby uh, starts off in the book basically doing what you do for a living, which is telling other people's stories. Right. But then the Libby character, who bears some resemblance to you, some maybe. some resemblance to you, maybe, um, uh, becomes more of a character, and right. the and and the relationship of Toby and Rachel. That is that is the main uh, focus of this book, uh, the impact of that, right? And and the impact uh, on her relationship and how right. she thinks about marriage yeah. uh, comes into play. Doesn't that always happen though? That when you're couple friends with somebody, and you know, I've had some real doozies in the past couple of years. People that I had no idea suddenly getting divorced, and it really rocks your world and forces you to ask the question of like, how did I not see it coming? And also, do I not see it coming, right? Do I not see the thing coming? And everyone I know who's gotten divorced 
was totally optimistic about it right up until the end. They were sure things were going to work out until one day it was too exhausting. And so I think that because of my parents' divorce, because I have so much divorce in my family that I come to it with a lot of humility. Um, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people interviewing me who are dancing around this question of like, you know, are you and Claude okay? <laughs> um, and if you ask Claude that, he, he would say, oh, oh, she's obsessed with divorce. She's always been obsessed with divorce. Um, my youngest sister, um, when she gave a speech at my wedding, the speech was, I hope you're married for a really long time. And everyone was like, <gasps> you know? And, my, and Claude was like, does she know that, that she's supposed to say forever at these things? And I was like, I think really long time is like, it's, it's her optimism, you know, and, and hey, you know, 13 years, Claude. Um, but I think that these things, be, like, I think the amount of people who have told me that they're getting divorced, I think that I would have to be more self-conscious than I am to worry that an interesting exploration of it wasn't in order. But I wanted to do this as a magazine story. The first thing I wanted to do, I called my GQ editor and I said, I said, after speaking to one of my friends and seeing his phone, I said, we should do a story about the way people are dating now, which is on apps. <laughs> and, he, and he said, you know, you don't always sound so out of touch. <laughs> Sometimes they would question the wisdom of a suburban housewife in her 40s writing their stories. Um, but he would, but he said, you could do that. I would love to read it somewhere, but the GQ reader won't understand it. They've only ever had apps. They don't know the other thing that you're talking about, old lady. And, <laughs> and, so, and, and so I just sat down and started writing it as a novel. And it was so much easier to do that than, than what I would have done, which is like follow some guy for a year and beg him to tell me things. Now, there's, there's a part in the, of the book where Libby says to Toby about how he never appreciated, Toby never appreciated her craziness, yeah. in her words, her craziness. Yeah. And he went for Rachel, who was, in his view, yeah. perfect, but also boring and predictable. And normal, not crazy. Not crazy. Yeah. But there's a, there's a whole theme in this book about um, what is messy versus what is looks perfect right. and how what looks perfect is not right. actually perfect. Right. Ever. It always falls apart, right? Like, I keep wondering how... I mean, it, it, it's like the Gwyneth Paltrow thing. Like, we all are in search of our, of our best possible selves and wondering how we are functioning when we are not doing this kind of modern platonic ideal of how we're supposed to behave and how we're supposed to um, optimize ourselves and how we're supposed to be these like these amazing m meditating yoga doing like clean eating like all these words we have for more suffering right <laughs> like and 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 when I see, like, when I read that, you know, the, that feature on the cut, um, how I get it done, I look at those women who are like, I start the day off with five hours of kundalini meditation, and I am like, you must be in so much pain, and you must, like, your life must be miserable, probably you're lying, and also, like, what is it that, you, that makes you need to do this? And I think it's the messier thing that is more sustainable, when the cut asked me what I do in the morning, I said, if things are going well, I watch television. I watch like old episodes of things. And I cannot tell you how easy it is to stay on that routine. <laughs> like, <laughs> I am never angry at, like I never have to deal with dis the disappointment of not wanting to do it. Like old episodes of what? So, okay, that's a good one. So, Recent, so recently, the kids and I were watching Wonder Woman, which is... Linda Carter Wonder Woman? Oh, yeah. And before that, we were watching The Hulk. The Hulk is a very slow-moving show. And the kids were mystified because they are like, why is it moving so slowly? And I was like, kids, in the old days, things used to move so slowly. 
And he'd be like, you know, he's like walking through the woods and he's making new friends. It was like this weird procedural where he just like walked through the woods and found a Mennonite family that needed saving. Or he walks through the woods and he finds a woman who feels trapped in her marriage. It's amazing. You should all do it. Do it tonight, tomorrow morning. Do it tomorrow morning. Don't go to yoga. Do this. So there's another moment between um, Toby and Libby. I'm sorry, we can keep talking about Bill Bixby if you want. I, uh, and the greater works of Lou Ferrigno. I know, I know. Knight Rider is next. <laughs> um, but there's another moment uh, where Libby and Toby have a confrontation. Yeah. Where Libby said, where, where Toby says... Libby sa says to him, like, you know, I, I could use a friend, too. She's this yeah. wonderful. They were friends in their Israel program in college, and, yeah. then, and then they lost touch. And then when he was getting divorced, he reached out and, became, and they became friends again. Yeah. And, and Libby says to Toby, I, I could use a friend, too. I, you know, I'm a human, too. And Toby looks at her and says, what possible need could you have? Yeah. That felt like something that maybe happened to you once or that you felt. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> It happens to me all the time. Like, nobody wants to hear how a good um, book review can cause you some suffering. I know that sounds crazy. Like, that's all you want. But last week when I got all these reviews, I became incredibly depressed. That I, I shouldn't say that. But, but also, when, someone, when your friends are getting divorced and you're like, I don't know if I should leave GQ and go to the New York Times, everyone is like... How dare you bring this problem? This is not a problem. This is like an embarrassment of riches. Um, and that that's a thing that happens to me all the time. It's a thing I do to other people all the time. The only person I know who does not do it is my sister Tracy, who can listen to anybody's problem about anything. And she read, a long time ago, she read that book, um, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen. And she applies it to adults. And she says, <laughs> she says, oh, that sounds really hard. And it, and it feels so good. It feels so good when she does that. <laughs> which were, which that, and that naturally leads to a, a, a subplot of the book. Toby is a, a physician, and and uh, I don't I don't want to again no spoilers. But the Coopers, yes, are a family where there's a medical problem. Yeah, and this is serious business. Yeah. And I I felt like you maybe I'm wrong. I felt like maybe you put it in there like to underline like this is really what matters and 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 everything else is important but this is this is the, i mean or let I me just think so. no why that put wasn't it, in? it okay everything in i think in every story i write the a good metric for how to make sure you are not like fatty in your story is that every single thing has to be about the thing and you look at the story and it's about a woman who has a liver disease she comes in unconscious so you never get to hear from her, but everybody gets to impose upon her everything that they think about this like wonderful woman who's lying in bed, maybe dying. Um, I chose that disease. She has, it's, it's, it's early on, it's not a spoiler. Um, it's called Wilson's disease. And I chose it because it is, I searched very hard for a, for a good disease that would do this, that would be poetic. Um, and a friend of mine um, who's a nephrologist told, told me about Wilson's disease. And, and I fell in love with the liver. He's, that's kidneys. But he would live with, like, the liver. It's so romantic. It, like, it, like, it regenerates when it's damaged. It's beautiful. It's like a good novel, you know. So it's a liver disease where, where the earliest signs of it are um, copper rings around the... Iris. And I liked the idea, it's kind of a hint, that if anybody had been looking her in the eye, they would have known about this long before it ever happened. A lot of the book is about whether or not you could predict the bad things that happened to you. And all, the answer is always yes. Not things like a car crash, but things like people who are like, people who, who get divorced and are like, I don't know what happened. She was always angry. I'm like... <laughs> I don't know. Did you ask her about that? Like, was like, where did the anger come from? When did it start? I feel like people don't really do that as much as they should. Or maybe by the time they were talking to me, it was it was done, and they were now they were now insisting on their own versions. I don't know. Well, it's a it's a great 
um, subplot. Um, and I, and I know we're going to, um, open the floor up to questions in a few minutes, but I just have a few more questions and then we will, we will do that. Um, you have a line in here, page 283 that I want you to read. See, I do need glasses. <laughs> I am at 50. Okay. Start. Just do the, that okay. part. Again, I'll say, again, I'll say it. Life is a process in which you collect people and prune them when they stop working for you. The only exception to that rule is the friends you make in college. <laughs> is anybody here friends with people from college that they would absolutely never be friends with now? Yeah. If you're not raising your hand, it's because you're next to the person. <laughs> and I hear you. And I sit yeah, so, this, I so this isn't Libby. This is not Libby. This, this, is, you, this is Taffy. So, yeah, 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 I agree with her. And I agree with the narrator on this and, point. And Toby is a friend from college. Toby is a friend from college. And also, Seth is a friend from college. Seth is another main character who's a finance bro. I've been saying finance bro a lot. Is it, a, is, it was bro in, like an epithet? Is it yet? Like, no, are you allowed fine. to say it? Okay, finance bro. He's a finance bro who is not married and who loves the apps and who loves all sorts of sex. And, um, and, a thing that is mystifying to me is how now I'm 43 years old and I'm so picky about who I hang out with and nobody lives up to this ideal I have for like a new friend, which is like I live in a, I moved to a new place five years ago and people have been inordinately nice to me for somebody who is so picky. I'm like, oh, these people, they don't understand me. Um, but my friends from college are people I would never even inter I, I would never meet them. I would never find them. What about you? Do you have that? Or are you um, friends with? I would say that I have picked up since college three friends. Right, right. And your friends from college, are they people that, are, do you have friends from college? I have a ton of friends from college, yeah. And are they people that you are not baffled about at all? Some of them are baffling. Yeah. <laughs> but also Jake went to a better college than I did. <laughs> It's the same thing, though. It's the same phenomenon. It's the Ivy League. This was Ivy League. <laughs> Libby, you, know, you said you like Rachel. I do. Libby, for most of the book, does not like Rachel. Thinks she's no. a, thinks she's a social climber. Yeah. Thinks all she cares about is wealth. Right. Yeah. Um, do I like Libby? Is the question? No. It's just it's it's just it's interesting because to me it's like kind of one of your profiles, which right. is. But it changes. It changes. Right. I think that the, the reason Libby exists there is because maybe I'm not um, like crafty enough to figure out a way. I, I, at first, the book was third person. Do you know that? Um, I couldn't figure out a way to shift the perspective so that you were finally wondering what other people, what, what Rachel's defense would be, unless you had somebody witnessing the thing, which is a thing I do in my profiles, right? Like I, 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 I witness the information and then I metabolize it. And that's, and at first I, it was third person. And someone said to me, why is it third person when you so clearly are in this and you so clearly want to say something? And I said, well, because this is a novel. And he pointed out to me that no one usually does that in profiles either. So I decided to go for it. And that's when the book started working out. Can I just also observe that? Yes. Um, that's also like your Gwyneth Paltrow profile was more autobiographical than a lot of your other profiles. Was that, do you think, because you were writing the novel at the same time? No, it's because it's Gwyneth Paltrow. And Gwyneth Paltrow, like everyone's feelings about Gwyneth Paltrow, every woman's feelings about, I think that the only, in 2017 when I started that, the only two people every woman in America had an opinion about were Hillary Clinton and Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> and there's something about Gwyneth Paltrow that, that, make, that is a mirror of what, like, she, I've, as someone who's been around, she's perfect. She's like, I know you're not supposed to say that about people, but I promise you, I've spent hours with her, and she's funny, and she's cool, and she's pretty, and her posture's good, and she has very high arches in her feet, and she, her, her teeth are fine, and she can smoke one cigarette a week, and, and, she, and, and she's, like, she can bust out rap lyrics. Like, there's nothing a Everything that I was always taught through women's magazines, through television shows, is the thing I was supposed to be. 
she is, and I'm still not. Like I, like if I think about my mind's eye when I was doing that story, I grew like boils on my face in front of her. <laughs> like my nose turned into this hooked thing and I was like, uh, hello Gwyneth. And she was politely pretending I was normal. She is kind of a quack, right? I mean her... her... Perfect quack. <laughs> She's not a doctor, so I don't know if she can be a quack. She pedals. She pedals some quack. Quackery. Quackery. Yeah. yeah. Can I also just say, didn't quack. didn't Goop her website tweet something nice about your book? Stunningly. It was shocking. It was more shocking to me than to anybody else. Um, see, she's perfect. Like anyone else would have been like roiling and like. She doesn't even hold a grudge. She doesn't. She's like, I don't have grudges. I'm perfect. <laughs> We can, uh, I see a microphone there. And there's one there. And there is there, and there's one right there. If anyone else wants to ask questions, I will keep asking until we get volunteers. All right, I'm, I'm fine. I got, I got plenty. Yeah, go I'm a reporter. It. Oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Try not to. Um, no. <laughs> uh, maybe close though. I'm very flattered. I did not, I could not. Are you in town? I could not, I could not in- stay out oh, okay, at okay. <laughs> when I was. Well, I'll, I'll just be up for a second. Um, um, my my question is, uh, how do you separate um, the person from the fame? And I, I, I like uh, I would find myself sort of fangirling these people, even though that's your job, obviously. Um, and like in the in the Bradley Cooper profile, you do such such um, a great job of using sort of the mechanisms of being the PR machine and, you know, that glossy profile and sort of creating this profile of, of, with negative space, you know, around him and seeing the person. And is that, how do you, how do you approach that? Um, thank you. Yeah. So you can sit down, <laughs> sit down and do a cleansing breath. Um, <laughs> um, I think I'm not very starstruck. I don't know why I'm not very starstruck, but their fame is part of their story. It, it, it's not separate from them anymore. They have now been famous for a long time and they're through the looking glass and now this is who they are famous. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in who they are without fame because, because it does because it's not real. That's not a person anymore. They don't remember who that person was, you know. So, um, if and also if you spend enough time with ever with anyone, you the thing that you you're worried about, like being dazzled, it goes away because what happens is is that they show up three hours late, and you know you you are you were supposed to drive the carpool, but now you can't, and so the moms at home resent you for doing another shift. And you do not, you are not dazzled anymore. (laughs) You are not dazzled when you are like, like, you know, what have I done? I've like, I've been on a, I've been on a Ferris wheel with someone for four hours interviewing them. That's not dazzling. That like gets old very quickly. Um, So I think that's my job. Like my job is to And also when I interview them, it's at this moment of extreme fame. So I think the fame is kind of the point. Cool. We're going to, you can come over to the microphone. The woman, this woman's here, but then you can come over. Oh, wait, do you want me to? No, no, go ahead to the microphone. Hi. Hi. Um, So who, I've got, it's like a little two-part question. Um, who of, sorry, who of the people that you've profiled so far has surprised you the most or, or I guess shifted your kind of any preconceived notions that you ever had about them? Because I imagine that's impossible not to have as you're interviewing these enormously famous and very well-known people. Um, and who have you not profiled, but would, you know, who's like the top of your list, the next person, maybe this year even, uh, if you ever get the extra time. Um, so yeah. Okay. So the person who has surprised me the most has maybe been, um, wait, let me go, let me do the second one first. Okay. Cause I, I don't need, I'm like trying to picture my website and who I've <laughs> interviewed. Um, Billy Bob Thornton, I don't think he's surprised me the most. So I'm doing the first one first. Okay. Um, 
I don't think he surprised me the most, but he surprised me a lot with his generosity and the experience of the profile, which is something that I started doing this 10 years ago. And, and the kind of access he gave me was something that people didn't, uh, haven't gotten since the 80s. He took me on his, he has a band, and he took me on his tour bus for four days. And like just the willingness to be that famous, to have been married to Angelina Jolie, and the, that willingness to both sit with me all day throughout Alabama and to get drunk and to like just have like realness was a, sh a wonderful shock to me. Um, the person, I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow was my white whale for very long. Like there was nobody, there was not an editor in New York who did not know that if a Gwyneth Paltrow profile came up, I would violate any contract I had to do it. In fact, when the profile came up, it came through from an Obama crisis guy, because it was a crisis, through one of our political reporters who brought it to our editor in chief and the editor-in-chief said, I think it's in Taffy's contract that if a Gwyneth Paltrow profile comes up, I have to do it. So now I don't know. I don't, you know, Melania. I would love to hang out with Melania. I love Trump. I'm kidding. I know. I love seeing her. <laughs> I would love to hang out with Melania Trump. I don't know if she'll let me, but I don't know. I don't know. I've been a little bit down since Gwyneth. <laughs> like what's gonna be what's gonna be as good as Gwyneth? Maybe maybe nothing. That's okay. If you have suggestions, I'm here after. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to ask this gentleman over here wanted to ask a question? Come on, come on over. Yep. We'll get to you sooner yeah. or later. You are articulate, observant, and one of the funniest people I have ever spent time listening to. Thanks, Mom. Okay, hi. <laughs> Okay, sweetie, come on, you can come home now. Okay. I am a mother, and I would say that about my daughter. No, <laughs> she's tougher than you are. Um, but, what I, but when I think of somebody who writes, I mean, you're not out in the public a lot. You're, you're behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think of doing more things in public? And I mean, I would say being a comedian would be one, but. No, I have a real fear of public speaking. Really? Um, I, like, I could do this. I can't stand in front of you and read a thing or talk at you. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I once gave a, I once gave a thank you speech for an award. It's a humble brag. Um, <laughs> and it, was, it went so badly that it was a media speech. Someone asked me if I wanted to do a story about like learning how to, pu how to speak. Pu like, <laughs> would I like to go to Toastmasters and learn how to give That's a good amazing. public speech? And, and to me, a writer is somebody who's a more private maybe introverted person, you know, who can work on their own by themselves. And you seem like such a people person. I am. That's why I like Twitter. It's so bad. <laughs> and I would rather have you as a friend than Gwyneth Paltrow. Thank you. I think we all feel that way. Thank you. This gentleman has been... she would make you feel terrible. <laughs> I agree. Thank, thank you very much. You're very nice. So um, I'm really curious about what you said earlier. Um, you said that... Everyone in the world deserves some kind of defense. And uh, I think that... Do you have some exceptions? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's a very good belief. Um, but I don't think it's a very common one. Uh -huh. And I'm curious where you think that comes from. Like, that belief comes from in you. Like, I, I don't know. It, I, it's not a very common belief. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about why it's not very common. I don't know. I don't know. I think it is common and that we're all afraid of looking bad by empathizing with the wrong people. I don't know, though. I don't know why more people don't believe that. But I hope that people I hope that people do. I think they say they do and they are not and not everyone knows how to because we let our feelings get in the way. But remember that when I'm writing about people, I'm not related to them. I've never been like screwed over by them other than the three hours that I've been waiting for them to show up. Like I, I can see people in a very clear way and they are, and what they're doing in that moment is not friendship. They, they're not idiots. They see the tape recorder. They have done this before. They know what they're doing and everything they say to me is, is, they're trying to convey their point of view. And when somebody's doing that in an earnest way, they deserve to be listened to. And what, what like, there, there's a 
kind of profile that just beats someone up for being sincere? And why would you use your time with somebody who was being sincere with you to do that? Like, that's the access. I had this quiet, intimate moment, and I heard what this person's gripe was with the world. Why would I not convey that to somebody? That's what I think. Thanks. Thank you. It's a good question. Hey, um, I'm here with three other intern reporter, reporters right now in D.C., so my question is kind of like, do you have any advice for us writing style coming up in journalism in this time? Wait, tell me, what, like, what are you, you're doing reporting now? Yes, uh, three other intern reporters. Hello, intern reporters. I'm so happy that you're still, that we're still doing this. <laughs> um, yes, my advice is to never say an, a political opinion out loud because especially in your generation, it'll follow you forever and people won't trust you. Um, and this, and the other thing is um, that you should all share with each other when you get your first jobs what you're making so that you can all, so that you can all, thank you, you're so much nicer than Twitter on this, um, so that you can all make sure, especially you as a man, you could make sure that there's a woman over there, right, mm -hmm. that she is getting as much as you are, and that you, and that she know, she even knows that she could ask for it. Um, the more you share your ideas, people are very, um, and this is the third thing I'll say, and then I'm done, um, People, people's instinct is to sh is to be cheap with their ideas. But every time I tell somebody that I, um, what my ideas are, they get better because people feed into it. Um, and I guess there's some marginal case for maybe people steal your ideas, but I I have a spiritual belief in it that like that generosity breeds more generosity. So. That's good. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I have uh, two questions. Um, you said that you like to observe. So what specifically do you look for when you're profiling someone? Mm -hmm. What are you observing exactly? And um, how long does it take them to sort of let their guard down and show you who they are? Because these are people that are so used to being in the limelight. Um, how do you? How long does it take to hang out with them to really get to know them? <clears throat> it's everyone is different. That's the second one first. Everyone is different in that regard. Um, and most people, by the time I've interviewed them, have been so burned that it is a, it takes a lot of work of me trying to convey that I'm listening, right? That I'm not, like, trying to talk over them or I'm not – I don't have some kind of agenda – and that I don't have very many questions that I'm, I really want to hear what it is they had to, what they have to say. When I observe people, what am I looking for? I love facial expressions. I did coin Jake Tapper, what the fuck face. I know that, <laughs> I know, I know that it's used commonly now, but I should have trademarked it. I would be a rich woman. Um, I love a facial expression. I love hand motions, and I like seeing how people. Like I think your whole body. Like look at me. I'm like. I'm like a puppeteer. Like, like <laughs> what people do when they're talking is really interesting to me. So that's she it. likes. To, she asks. She wants to eat with people. I do. As a subject of an interview, she she's always she always she was very eager to eat with so me. So do you, do you, do, you, do you take? It's an expensed lunch. Well, she but but you want to see how we you know you want to see how we interact with the wait staff. You want to see no, if I there just, are any quirks. I want the free lunch. Uh. <laughs> of course, you're going to be nice to the wait staff. Do you, do, do you take notes or do you just record? And I record and then I take some notes. And when I take notes, I'm very willing to show what they are. I say, I say because people get distracted when suddenly you put down a note and I'll, and I'll tell them what it is. And I'll say, I'm just writing down what your facial expression is right now or what you're wearing. Or, and that's usually it. Or a question that I want to remember to ask later. But those are the only notes I take. I left the tape recorder. Tape recorder. That's inter intern friends. Tape recorders. Do not. No phones. Don't mess around. No phones. No phones. Phones? <laughs> You're, you, do you use a phone to tape record people? Uh, no, but I see, I see a lot of other. Don't do it. No? Use a tape recorder. Use a mini tape with recorder. A with a little cassette? No. It's oh, the, digital, it's digital. the millennium, Jake. <laughs> I got a sonographer. I got a sonographer back at the office. <laughs> um, I use an Olympus. I use, I use an Olympus, and then for tape recording phone calls, there's a $21 device that Olympus sells called the Telephone Pickup, 
where it plugs into the phone and it goes into your ear. And then when you're holding the phone to your ear, it hears, you know how the earpiece hears your voice and also their voice? It's, 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 it's so good. And um, when I have an, ep- like when some of my reporting ends up on the New York Times podcast, The Daily, it very often, um, it like, they say it's the only kind of sound quality they can use other than the big, you know, headphones with the microphone in someone's face, which, by the way, is a great way to terrify your subject. <laughs> Hi. Um, I recently read a profile that seemed a lot about the writer versus the person they were interviewing. So my question for you, um, and I and I married into a writer journalism family. So um, I love when I can hear people's voices, but how do you check yourself or do you when you're preparing, when you're interviewing? Was it one of my profiles? It wasn't my profile. No, it was okay, I won't say who. Um, and Good. when you're writing and editing, or, or do you, because it's it's your experience. My editors yeah. know what my goal is, but the only version of me that ends up in my story is the same version of of I that ended up in here, which is the the I that you that the reader needs to understand how I'm experiencing the information. Even an like a parenthetical aside that is indulgent will ruin everything. And I think that people trying to do first person stuff don't always see that. But as an American woman, I know how barely tolerated I am. And so I've learned how to be completely efficient with it. I mean, it's funny, but it's also true, right? Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Tell me later who the family is. (laughs) Hi. Did you find it a challenge to write from the perspective of male protagonists? Not at all. I was at GQ for a while, and I wrote a lot about men there. And and I think that I I think I think there aren't as many differences as we like to think there are. Um, but mostly, what I think about men versus about writing about men is that like it's it's so much easier to write about men because they. Because, first of all, I would bring all my issues to a woman. Look what I did with Gwyneth Paltrow. Poor Gwyneth Paltrow just wanted a profile. And I was like, isn't it sad how I have flat feet, right? (laughs) Jake didn't get that. I wasn't like, oh, my face isn't a what-the-fuck face. (laughs) Um, But men are great. I've always preferred to write about men because when I write about women, when I write about women, it is always that it was so hard for them to become somebody that I, I would be writing about who deserves coverage. They had to fight so hard that the story is always about the fight. Whereas when you write about men who did not have to fight to do the thing that they want to do in arts for the most part, um, you get to hear something that's more like a struggle of the soul, which is more interesting to me. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of experience in writing about men, and I was at a men's magazine, so it's kind of a first language for me. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. He Hi. sort of asked part of my question, but I was going to say, you're, you're best known for writing your celebrity profiles, but I love my favorite stuff you write is always about yourself, oh. about your mom. and <laughs> No, I love it about your Judaism and your friends and family. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm like a third of the way through and really enjoying it so far. And wow. I was going to ask how you decided to make your main character a man, but I also wanted to know how you decided to make the narrator a woman watching a man. Um, I think that it's the same question. The man, he became a man when, because for this, for the reason I said before, which is that it was so much funner to watch a man do the apps and do these things. And also one of my favorite stories I ever did was a story about sex discrimination against a male synchronized swimmer. The U.S. has one male synchronized swimmer, and he is fighting to be included in the Olympics. And it is bonkers to watch, like, a white man fight for inclusion. And it was so crazy to me. And he, like, that I think that's a good way of telling a story, to not tell the beleaguered tale. If you're going to tell a beleaguered tale, for it to not be the one that you think it's going to be. Um, And then she was a woman because, because... there needed to be a woman character because it was it was it was it was him and his best friend and i just felt like there would be a woman and also a woman's sympathies can shift when she starts to wonder if the story he's telling about his ex-wife is is 
an accurate story, right? She alone is capable of hearing, overhearing Toby say things that his, his angry wife used to say. And thinking to herself, oh, my God, I say those things, too. That's what the Othello board thing is about. Like, oh, my, am I one day going to find out that this thing I said innocuously was actually quite terrible? Thank you. Let me know when you're done. All right. So we're going to do, um, are you in line, too, ma'am? We're going to do two more questions, and then, uh, and then that'll be good. Um. When you're negotiating access to these people yeah. that are used to having all the leverage in the situation, what do you ask for beyond lunch? Like, how do you put yourself in a position to observe these people where you're actually observing them and you're not just doing the Q&A part of it? So I agree to their their terms at first. And then I always I always say the same thing, which I think is funny and, and publicists never think is funny, which is I say... I'd like to quote from my favorite movie, Indecent Proposal. <laughs> Nothing will happen that he didn't want to happen. <laughs> Which I think is a funny thing to say. Um, your publicist didn't think it was that funny. Um, but it's that I'll show up and if you don't, you do what you've agreed to do. And if, if it's cool and if you don't find me to do to be too much of a pain, can I come back? Can I come back and now watch this? Can I come back and ask a few follow-up questions? Do you mind if I see you in your natural habitat? Do you mind if I come over and have dinner? That's my big ask. And a lot of people say no to that. <laughs> I have been rejected for my inviting myself over for dinner by some very famous people. <laughs> we, I invited you over after the profile. Yeah, I was out. like, now, now the, you're in. I'm like, now you, I'm in. <laughs> Okay. Last question. Hi. Um, so I haven't read the book, but I you Not did. Two days ago. I know. Um, but I did read your um, review of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. It totally changed my life, and I went to go oh see it, God. and it's amazing. It was it really wasn't great. In Yiddish. I wrote it in English. No, no, no. But it's in Sorry. Yiddish. <laughs> to clarify, yes. you're right. Isn't the it play. Great? It was amazing. Uh, I cried so hard. Anyway, so hard. Um, and I'm friends with Adi, so that's why I'm here. Yeah. Shout out. It's good. Um, it's good. So I haven't read the book, but question, uh, you were talking a lot about kind of the, the male main character. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the main character had been a woman. Yeah. Do you think you'd get the same attention and critical review or it would have been dismissed as like chick lit? Um, that's a great question. And you're absolutely you're you're maybe right. It's a question. I in that know. in that I think I already had um a, this is a good enough reputation as a writer that my story might be taken seriously, but it's certainly, it, it like it, it certainly is a, is a good question. If I think of it that way, this is how I'll think of it: women, men are interested in stories about men. Women are interested in stories about men and women. So if you had to play the numbers and you wanted a bestseller. <laughs> What would you do? And that is absolutely. And by the way, when I started writing for GQ, I was writing for a while. And when I started writing G for GQ, and I was writing about a lot of stories that had me in them, that was when people started listening to me. That was crazy. I don't know. I wrote this. I started writing this in 2016. I wonder if enough has changed. But... I think it's a very valid question, and I think your 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 cynicism is correct. <laughs> yeah, and also probably people still think it's chiclet, or I don't know what people think it is. Like people, people keep asking me this question in my press run. Like, are you offended at being called a beach read? I'm like, it's June. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I'm a magazine writer. Most things I write are read on the toilet. <laughs> like. <laughs> The beach is an incredible upgrade for me. <laughs> so, um, I just... <laughs> the last thing I'll say is, I'm actually envious of those of you who haven't read it, because now you get to read it for the first time. And when I was reading for the second time, I'm like, this is really great. But, I mean, I'm jealous of the people that haven't read it yet, because they, they get to read it for the first time. So you should read it. You can buy it up there, and then Taffy's going to be autographing books oh, over here. I want to uh, thank Politics and Prose, a great independent bookstore, yeah. once again, one of the best, if not the best. 
and Taffy, who's a delight in every way, and her writing even more so. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you all of you for coming out. Thank you, Jake.